Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us for this webinar on PRS for Music, Live Performance Reporting and Royalties delivered by the ISM Trust. I'm John Robinson, Head of Service Delivery and Systems here at the ISM, and with me is Harriet Wyball, Classical Account Manager at PRS for Music, who will be telling you all about live performance reporting and royalties at PRS for Music. Before we begin, I'd just like to outline a few technical points. You can't see us, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. You should also be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org forward slash webinars. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Harriet. Welcome, Harriet. And many thanks for coming back to the ISM to tell us more about how PRS for Music can help composers and songwriters with their royalties from live performance. Thank you, John. PRS for Music is a brand name which is used to describe two organisations, PRS, the Performing Rights Society, and MCPS, the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society both of which exist to protect and administer the rights of their members, which are songwriters, composers, and music publishers. MCPS was, sorry, PRS was founded in 1914, and it's a private membership organization owned by its members, which licenses performance rights. MCPS was founded in 1924, and it's a private organization owned by the UK Music Publishers Association, which licenses reproduction rights, which are known as mechanical rights. Together, PRS and MCPS have over 125,000 members, representing 22 million musical works. PRS and MCPS are known as collective management organisations or collecting societies. And when a songwriter, composer or music publisher joins PRS or MCPS as a member, they transfer some of their rights to that organisation to administer by licensing uses of their members' music and collecting and distributing the resulting royalties. We're going to focus on PRS today and how PRS licenses and collects royalties from live performances. PRS for Music plays an important role in protecting the value of copyright in the face of changing technology and evolving legislation, ensuring that its members' music is licensed properly and that royalties are collected and distributed fairly and effectively. PRS is a member of CSAC, the International Federation of Societies of Authors and Composers, which protects the rights and promotes the interests of creators worldwide and enables collective management organisations to represent creators throughout the world and ensure that royalties flow to creators for the use of their works anywhere in the world. PRS for Music is regulated by the EU Directive on the Collective Management of Copyright, the CRM Directive, which ensures transparency across all collective rights management organisations in Europe. PRS for, Mu for Music protects and promotes the value of copyright, which exists to ensure that creators are able to benefit financially from uses of their works and provide an incentive to create new works. Copyright is a form of intellectual property, which is intended to protect aesthetic and artistic creations such as literary, musical, dramatic and artistic works, as well as films, sad recordings, programmes, broadcasts and the typographical arrangement of a published work that is, the way the material is laid out in a book or a piece of music. The framework for copyright law is the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988, which has subsequently been amended on a number of occasions to cope with new technologies. In the UK, the duration of copyright in literary, dramatic and musical works lasts for 70 years after the end of the calendar year in which the creator dies. When you create a musical work, you are automatically the copyright owner, and you have the exclusive right to copy the music, issue, lend or rent copies to the public, perform, show or play the music in public, communicate the music to the public, that is broadcasting it via TV, radio or the internet, or adapt or change the work. There are some limited exceptions to this which are known as fair dealing exceptions, which exist for the purposes of non-commercial research and private study, criticism, review, quotation and parity, and reporting current events. The aspect of copyright that we're going to focus on today is the right to perform a musical work in public. 
When you join PRS, you assign the right of public performance to PRS to administer by licensing your works whenever they're performed in public. After joining PRS, the first and most important step for the composer or songwriter is to register the works online via the PRS website, so we know what your works are. You'll need to register for an online account if you haven't already got one, log in and click the icon that says register or amend my works. You should always include the duration when you register your works and we'll come on to why this is important a bit later on. PRS licenses venues that host live music events or promoters that organise live music events and the majority of them, depending on the tariff, send us reports of the music that has been performed. PRS invoices the venue or the promoter, collects the resulting royalties and distributes them to its members in four main quarterly distributions, April, July, October and December. Venues and promoters that host live music events fall into two main categories, concert venues such as concert halls, theatres, art centres and universities. These are venues whose primary business is the promotion of regular music events. Then there are non-concert venues, for example pubs, clubs, hotels, community centres and the London Underground. These are venues whose primary business is not the promotion of live music. If a premises is classed as a concert venue, then depending on where and how our members' music has been used, PRS will apply a variety of tariffs to a live performance, and we'll take a look at these first. PRS licenses live concert performances at a wide range of venues, and we charge the venue or the promoter a fee per concert based on a variety of tariffs. The two main concert tariffs are the LP, Live Popular Tariff, and the LC, Live Classical Tariff. The LC tariff covers classical concerts and venues or promoters are charged at 4.8% of box office receipts for the whole programme, where tickets are charged at over £5. In cases where tickets are less than £5, a minimum fee is charged based on admission. There are a few venues or promoters that choose to be licensed under a variable rate tariff, which is calculated on a sliding scale based on the amount of copyright music in the programme, up to 8% of box office receipts. The LP tariff covers popular and other styles of music, and venues or promoters are charged 3% of box office receipts. Festivals are usually licensed using a combination of these tariffs, and current details of all our tariffs are also available on our website. When venues or promoters report their live music events to us, we send them an invoice, and when we receive payment of that invoice, we distribute the royalties across all of the works reported in the programme or the set list. All the works in each concert are treated equally, and the royalty is divided between them in proportion to the performed duration that's reported to us. If no duration has been reported, we default to the duration on the work registration on our website. And this is why it's important to include the duration, especially for classical works. If you don't set a duration when you register a work, the system automatically uses a default duration of three minutes and one second. For classical concerts on the variable rate tariff, PRS only charges for the copyright works performed. But on the LC tariff of 4.8% of box office receipts, which is the one most commonly used for classical concerts, PRS charges for the whole programme and distributes the royalties to the copyright works within the programme. Therefore, if the programme contains both public domain and copyright works, all the royalties will be distributed to the copyright works proportionally according to their duration. In terms of how quickly you'll receive royalties from a concert, we aim to pay you in the next available distribution after we receive payment, which is usually 6 to 12 months from the date of the performance. However, different venues and promoters are invoiced in different frequencies according to when their licences are renewed. It might be monthly, quarterly, twice yearly or annually, so it also depends when your music was performed and when the venue was invoiced. Live music events at universities with an admission charge, excluding formal dances and balls, are charged at 3% of box office receipts. For other live music events, where the admission charge is less than £5 or where recorded music forms the dominant part, a minimum fee is charged based on admission. 
Variety shows and events are charged an annual royalty of 2% of the actual gross receipts from all variety shows to which the license applies. Discounts may apply where PRS controlled repertoire is performed for less than a quarter, half or three quarters of a variety show with a discount of up to 75%. For music used in the theatre, the royalty charge depends on how the music is used. For overture, on track and exit music, the theatre is charged an annual flat fee depending on the capacity of the theatre. For incidental or curtain music, the theatre is charged a weekly flat fee, again depending on the capacity of the theatre. Location is taken into consideration too. The charge for London West End theatres is higher than for the suburbs and regional theatres. Interpolated or background music, where the duration is more than 30% of the production, is charged on a sliding scale of 1-6% to of box office receipts, depending on duration. Where the duration is less than 30%, a flat fee basic royalty is charged per performance, again based on duration. It's really important to note that PRS does not control grand rights, which apply when music is used in a dramatic context, such as opera, ballet, contemporary dance and musical theatre. This is different from incidental, scene change or background music, which is licensed under our theatre tariff. For music to be considered a grand right, it must be central to the dramatic action in the plot or the storyline. If you write music for opera, ballet, contemporary dance or musical theatre, you should negotiate a fee with the person or organisation using your music directly. If you have a publisher or an agent, they will likely take care of this for you with your approval. Fees can vary and can take the form of a flat fee per performance or a percentage of box office receipts. In the UK, this can be up to about 10% and it varies overseas. Cathedrals, ministers and large churches that are known to hold more than six live music events per year and often have established audiences are licensed under our concert tariffs. The remainder are not licensed under a concert tariff, but are usually licensed under a general purpose PRS church music licence, which is issued on our behalf by Christian Copyright Licensing International, or CCLI. This licence covers all the church's music used in a year, up to six concerts, for a small blanket charge. It also includes background music in bookshops, gift shops and fitness classes in church halls. Events at these premises are not subject to automatic individual distribution under our concert distribution policy because no money has specifically been collected for them. Royalties for these events are distributed by analogy, which is calculated using research data. However, PRS members can also make claims for these concerts directly via our new online tool for reporting live performances, which we'll take a look at shortly. If a performance doesn't fit into any of the concert tariffs already described, or a general purpose tariff, it's licensed as a non-concert venue. These can include pubs, clubs, hotels, community centres, the London Underground, and smaller venues holding recitals, but where music isn't the venue's primary business. The main difference with these venues is that they are not required to report performances to PRS. However, it's still possible for members to claim royalties for these types of venues and events. The gigs, clubs and small venue scheme was developed to allow PRS members to collect royalties for performances of their works at non-concert venues. The scheme makes available a set royalty of £8 as of 2016 for the event or session being reported, which is apportioned between all the works that are reported in the programme or set list. Some of you may have previously reported performances of your works under the gigs, clubs and small venues scheme via an online form on our website. This has now been replaced with a new, more sophisticated and comprehensive online tool for reporting performances, which applies to works of any genre taking place at any venue in the UK and overseas, including churches licensed by CCLI, as previously mentioned. The tool was launched in full to all of our members at the end of February this year, and we're now going to take a closer look at how it works, uh, beginning with a short video.
So to report a live performance, the first step is to log into the PRS website and click on the icon Report Live Performances on the home page. You'll need to have your programme or set list ready and you'll need the dates and the venues where your music was performed. You can report a performance if you were performing your own music or someone else's or if you're not a performer but you're aware that an artist ensemble has performed your work, you can still report the performance as a composer. And also the new tool is also readily available on mobiles, tablets, as well as desktop computers. This is the home screen for the online reporting tool. You can click on Report a Live Performance to begin the process, or you can view your saved and submitted programmes or set list to check on the progress of your claims. When you get to this screen, choose the date of your performance and the country it took place in. If it's overseas, make sure you enter the correct country to avoid delays in the process later on. Then you can search for the venue. All licensed venues will appear, so choose the relevant one from the drop-down list. Notice in this example that in venues like the Barbican, where there are multiple performance spaces, the main hall for the Barbican Centre doesn't come up first in the list, so you'd have to scroll down for further to find it. This tool contains all PRS licensed venues. However, if a performance takes place in a venue that isn't licensed, you can still report it this to us using the postcode or Google Maps, and this will create a licensing lead for us to investigate. Once you've found the venue, you can start to add your set list or program. If you're touring or performing the same set list or program, you can save it for future reference, or you can create a new one. First, give your set list or programme a name so you can find it again. If you're touring, it might be UK Tour 2017, or if it's a one-off, you could choose just the performer and the date. So in this fictitious example, I've chosen the London Symphony Orchestra and the 6th of April. Then you have to search for the performer. That can be an ensemble or an artist, and specify whether they are the headliner or support. For classical concerts or instances where there is only one performer, choose headliner. You're now ready to add work, which works were performed. These can be your own works or works that are not written by you, but it's important to include the whole set list or program for the event. Here, I'm searching for Emily Howard's work, Magnetite. As you can see, if you enter a title in the search box, it will come up with all the works on our database that have that title. Then you just have to choose the correct one. If there are too many to choose from, you can refine your search criteria by adding the composer's name or the artist's name. If you can't find a work at all because it hasn't been registered, if it's your own work, you need to go back and register it first. If it's not your own work, you can notify us of the title and the name of the composer. When you select the work, it shows you the registered duration, which you can amend if necessary. It's important that this is correct because this is what we use to determine what your share of the royalties from the event should be. Continue to add the other works in the set list or program in the same way until it is complete and then click submit. You can see all of your saved or submitted set lists or programs whenever you log into the tool and check on the status of your claims. If you want to back claim royalties, you can go back up to 12 months for gigs, clubs and small venues, and up to seven years for concert venues, depending on the circumstances. PRS for Music has reciprocal agreements with collecting societies in over 150 countries overseas, so, as we've discussed, you can also report overseas performances using the tool. 
To back claim overseas performances, you can go back up to three years, but it's more difficult to license overseas venues retrospectively, so we'd always advise you to try and report them as soon as possible. We have answers to frequently asked questions in depth on our website on the Report Live Performances page. We also have a dedicated member services team who can offer support and answer queries about royalties. If you're a writer member of PRS, the email address is writerquery at prsformusic.com. And if you're a publisher, the email address is publisherquery at prsformusic.com. If you're not yet a member of PRS, but you write music and it's been performed in public, you could be earning royalties from your performances. You can join PRS via our website, which is prsformusic.com forward slash join. The joining fee for new members is £100, which is a one-off payment for lifetime membership. And this brings us to the end of the presentation part of this webinar, so we've now got time to move to some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Harriet. Really interesting, and what an amazing array of tools that PRS for Music has now developed for its members to report um, on its live performances. Um, and the fact that it has a global reach as well, very, very impressive. And I hope that anybody listening who's a PRS member takes full advantage of these things. Um, I imagine there's going to be a lot of guidance on the website as well if people want to find their ways around it. Absolutely, but we have found so far it's, um, it is quite intuitive yes. um, and the feedback that we've had so far is positive. So we're really hoping that this will make a real, really big difference to our members. Excellent, excellent. Well, this is your opportunity now um, for questions to Harriet on any aspect of the presentation that she's given today. So do type them in. Um, and we will be happy to try and answer them. Um, we've got plenty of time, um, but if you've got a question that you're burning to have an answer to, don't hold back, please let us know. Right, okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, a, a question from Kevin, did I hear you say that performances of compositions can also benefit from PRS membership? Harriet. Um, so any work that is performed in public can be due royalties from PRS. And in that situation, the songwriter or the composer would be due royalties from PRS. Um, the performer themselves wouldn't normally benefit from any royalties from PRS unless they had written the works themselves. Thank you very much, Harriet. And thank you, Kevin, for that question. All right, we've got another question here from David. Thank you, David. For music used in churches, at what point is, is a distinction made between a concert and divine worship, which has traditionally been exempt? Very good question. Yes, it's a great question. Um, PRS chooses not to license music which is used in religious services. Um, however, when music is used in a concert which has an audience which doesn't have um, a, re a religious aspect to the service, um, and is usually charging an admission fee, even if it's just a small admission fee. That's what we would class as a concert. Okay, so it's the context that creates um, whether you were charged for something, not necessarily the repertoire, because the repertoire could be... Absolutely, so albums, um, for example, can, can often be performed both as part of a religious service and as part of a concert. Um, I think the other defining um, thing as well is that you wouldn't, a church or um, another religious institution wouldn't normally um, charge admission to one of their religious services. Right. And it's it's that distinguishing feature that enables PRS to charge a license fee. Right, very clear. Thank you. I, David, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, anybody else got any other questions out there? Harriet, just while we're waiting, um, you mentioned that people have been finding the tools sort of very intuitive, which is great to hear. Um, have there been any other um, questions that have emerged where people have needed a bit of advice? Is, are there any patterns or is it all plain sailing at the moment? Um, it tends to be fairly straightforward, but we have noticed when reporting overseas venues, it's quite easy to uh, leave UK in the country box and that can cause you problems when right. you're reporting the overseas performance. So it's worth just, uh, just handling that um, and making sure that you put the correct country in. Right. Very good. All right, we've got a few more questions here. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, Simon will take yours. 
Simon asks, for small gigs, etc., is the £8 shared between all the composers and songwriters? Yes, it's shared between all of the composers and songwriters that are in copyright. Okay, very clear. All right, a question from David again, thank you. How does PRS deal with music performed in schools and similar educational establishments? Um, if it's a concert where um, there's a, an, an audience that's been invited and they might be paying admission or they might not, then it would be charged under probably a, either a small venue license or one of our concert licenses, depending on the venue and depending on the sort of events that they hold. Um, for music that's performed in an educational setting, if it's not inviting a public audience and that they're not paying, um, they're not paying any admission charge, then we wouldn't normally license those. But it, it does vary, so um, educational establishments can be can be a bit of a grey area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. We have a question from Fiona here, and Fiona asks this: Did I hear correctly that when I report a live performance, I must report all the works? I frequently have course to report one or more short works in a longer program of choral music. That's right. I mean, when we receive um, reporting from venues or promoters, they would usually send us the whole program. Um, this supports the information that we receive from venues and promoters, and it also gives our members the opportunity to claim for smaller venues and churches, as, as we mentioned before. Um, the reason that we ask for the whole programme is because we have to share the royalties between all of the works in the programme. And if you only report your own works or just one or two of the works, it might be that all of the royalties are distributed to just those works. If another member then comes along and tries to claim, we'd need to make a manual adjustment to do that. Um, and it, it would mean that you'd have to have some of the royalties taken back from that. Um, we do, there is an element of self-regulation in this, and I think, you know, there is an element of looking out for your fellow composers and songwriters as well when, when you're doing that. Um, but we do also spot check things. So there are, you know, if we see something that looks strange because it's only a few minutes in duration, that's something we'd probably spot. It wouldn't go through automatically and we'd have to do more research to find out what the program was. So that could cause delays in terms of distributing the royalties. Okay, thank you very much. So it's about supporting the intelligence around a gig and uh, a concept of some kind, so that you, can, you have the maximum information to make the most accurate distribution. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and of course, any particular live venue um, event, they're always um, thoroughly checked by, yeah. um, by staff at PRS before any distributions are made. Well, thank you, Harriet, and thank you, Fiona. Very good question. All right, here's one from Jackie, thank you. If my choir is performing, should I be contacting PRS to let them know what we're performing and where? Or is that the duty of the venue? It's usually the responsibility of the venue because it's the venue that's holding the live music event. Um, but we would normally advise that you check with the venue that they have a PRS license in place. And of course, encourage them to and help them to submit the correct program for that event as well. Um, because it's that information that really helps us to distribute royalties accurately to our members. There are instances where we would license you as a, as a choir, as a promoter, perhaps if you're doing a tour at unlicensed venues, or if you're performing at a number of venues. Um, this is quite often what happens with festivals, where a festival might be licensed as a promoter performing at a number of venues, rather than licensing each individual venue. But I would say in your case, it's most likely to be the venue that has responsibility for that. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jackie. All right, here's a very interesting question from Sandra. I'm planning a performance where my students will perform pieces with a backdrop on a screen of some video of the original artists. How is this assessed? Thank you. Um, well, this is a little bit different, and this actually usually falls outside of PRS's control. Um, whenever music is performed with visual content like a a TV program or a film or a video, um, that's called synchronization. And normally you would have to contact the composer or their publisher or their agent directly for permission to synchronize the musical work with, essentially it's defined as move, moving images in the film. Um, and they would normally give you permission to do that and charge a license fee. There are instances where a synchronization license is granted and then there is a PRS royalty due from the performance 
Um, but using music with a video is a separate issue that isn't normally handled by PRS. Um, and if you had any questions about that, I'd be more than happy to offline continue the conversation with you and give you a bit more information about that. Um, I, think we, I think we have your email address, so um, I can get in touch with you about that if that would be useful. Thank you very much, Sandra. Really interesting question. And Harriet, thank you for offering to take this one up with Sandra offline. All right, we've got a question here from Jocelyn. Thank you. What happens for works performed at private events, such as a wedding reception? Um, it depends on the venue, but with many rece wedding receptions, they would have a generic PRS license for any music performed at their venue. Um, that's something that would be considered a small venue rather than a concert venue, and therefore that's something you could claim online via the online tool and claim a set royalty fee for. Okay, that sounds very clear. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got a question from Chris who asks, when trying to report live performances using the new online tool, what happens if the venue isn't in your database? Um, if the venue isn't already licensed by PRS, um, you can still report the name of the venue and the postcode by searching on Google Maps. Um, that creates a licensing lead for our new business team and we use that to investigate new venues for licensing. If we can agree a license with that venue, um, then you could still be due royalties from that performance. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Chris. Um, Fiona has a comment again and she says, many churches host more than six concerts a year, but I don't think they're all licensed and it makes a big difference to the royalty paid. Um, if you have specific examples of churches that you think might fall into this category, that's something that we'd be happy to check for you. And again, I can get in touch with you offline and, and continue that conversation. Um, we do have over 15,000 churches which come under the CCLI licence um, for up to six concerts a year. So it is a very, very large number of, of churches that, that fall into that category. Okay, thank you very much for that. Just while we're um, with Fiona, she's asked another question, um, which uh, as follows. Um, I believe some choirs and music societies report performances to you via making music. Um, this does happen very occasionally where a venue isn't licensed and making music um, have an option to their amateur members that they can report performances to PRS via making music. Um, this happens relatively rarely and we would normally advise any choir or music society to first check with us whether the venue does have a license or not and whether that's something that, that we can investigate. Um, it does seem to be um, that the majority of events do take place at like venues that are already licensed. So we would only advise you to use Making Music if the venue was not licensed and there was no other way of, of taking that reporting. Great, thank you very much. And Fiona, thanks for that question too. All right, we've heard from Patrick um, who asks us this. I'm a folk musician and my sets consist of original music and arrangements of traditional or public domain songs. Should I list the entire set, even though it comprises 50% traditional music? Um, there are, I suppose there are two parts to this question, really. Um, because if your programme does contain public domain works, um, then it might be that you can't find them on our database because they won't be registered works, because they won't be earning any royalties. So in that case, you would just uh, report the copyright works in the programme. However, if you are making arrangements of traditional public domain works, then it might be that you could be claiming royalties for in the new copyright that's created when you make an arrangement of that. Um, so it sounds like you could be claiming copyright for those as well. Um, so that might be something to consider um, if, if that's something that's relevant to you. Okay, thank you. Just related to that, if I may, um, what should you do if you are performing traditional songs, the composer long out of copyright, um, but there's an arrangement in which you're performing, which you didn't arrange yourself, but the arrangement may be in copyright. What should you do in those circumstances? That's absolutely something that should be reported as part of the programme, because the work is in copyright, and the arranger is due a royalty for any performances of that work. Um, the other thing that I would just add with traditional and public domain works is that sometimes um, 
it can be easy to think that something is in the public domain when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, one example of this that came up um, recently was um, The Twelve Days of Christmas, which many people believe to be a traditional tune. It is, all apart from the two-bar phrase that is the five gold rings phrase. Um, that is actually still protected by copyright, and therefore the version of The Twelve Days of Christmas that most people know is protected by copyright. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> there are so many examples like that. The happy birthday scenario is Absolutely. a famous one, isn't it? <laughs> it still has a copyright. And of course, there's a very long, complicated copyright story attaching to The Lion Sleeps Tonight and Disney and uh, The Lion King, all this very interesting copyright mm. case. Um, and eventually, the songwriter's family were rewarded with a share of the royalties historically. So take care of your copyright out there and register things properly because it, it is important. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Kevin, thank you again. Um, Kevin asks, can you explain how arrangements of popular pieces of music, not public domain works, fall into PRS payments? I think we might have just touched on this, but... Sure. Um, well, normally, um, if you wanted a re to make an arrangement of a popular piece of music that was not in the public domain, so it's still protected by copyright, then you would need permission of the composer or their publisher to do so. If you make a cover version, it's slightly different um, because you, you're able to make a cover version without getting prior approval for that. And any performances or recordings of that would automatically be paid to the original copyright holders of the work. As I said, with arrangements, it's a little bit different. Depending on how much you're changing the work, you do need prior approval from the copyright owners of that work, which is usually the composer or their publisher. Um, what would normally happen if an arrangement was approved is that often um, the arranger would be required to assign the copyright in the arrangement to the original copyright holder. So any uses of that work, in whether it's being performed or whether it's being recorded, would always go back to the original copyright holder when that work um, is, is still protected by copyright. Okay, thank you. That's a, very, that's a very interesting situation. So all of the rights could continue to accrue to the original composer or rights holder. Um, including the new arrangements. Um, that's right, um, and in, in the majority of cases that's what would happen if, if an arrangement was approved. Right, okay, thank you, that's very, very interesting. Um, we've still got a bit of time for some more questions. Um, I'm just seeing if we have any more that have come in. Um, okay, we still have a couple of minutes. Oh, here we go. All right, no, let's just, uh, a technical point that's been picked up elsewhere, thank you. Um, all right, so in terms of where um, we are now with the tools, they're live, they're online, people can use them. Absolutely. And um, in a variety of technological environments. Yes, yeah, so it's compatible for mobiles, tablets and desktops as well, which is, um, I think, a real step forward from the, um, the setup that we had before. Um, so it's something that you can do, you know, particularly if you're um, performing popular music and a gig musician, it's something that you can do via your phone as soon as you've finished, which is great. So it's really easy to keep on top of. Yeah, absolutely. It completely transforms the whole relationship between um, the collecting society and PRS for music and the individuals out there, as you say, if you can put stuff on your mobile and deliver it to the database, um, PRS for music can get working straight away. Um, Absolutely, and it's, um, it's something that can really speed up the process. Um, and in terms of developing the tool further, we are looking into more things that we can do in the future to make it even more accessible to our members and offer even more functionality. So it's something that we're continually working on to improve the service that we're giving. Right. Excellent. All right, we've got a question here from Alexander. Thank you. Alexander is a classical composer and had major concert performance of his music years ago, which haven't resulted in royalties uh, often abroad. What can he do and is there a time limit to claiming? Um, there is a time limit. Um, with overseas royalties, it's sometimes possible to go back up to three years, but it's slightly more difficult 
to get these retrospectively if the performance overseas hasn't been licensed by the local society in that territory, just because it's more difficult to go back and retrospectively licensed. But that's always something that we can look into you via our member services team, or if you're a classical composer, um, via myself as the classical account manager. Um, we can certainly help you to look into anything like that. So. Um, if I drop you a line after the webinar um, and you'd like to send me the information about that, we can look into that in a bit more detail. Um, we're really hoping that because you can report overseas via the new tool, this will really help to reduce instances like this in which you haven't received any royalties. If you're aware of your works being performed and you tell us about it at the time, that really, really helps to, to get the royalties through from that overseas society. Great, thank you. Um, Fiona asks, is there a list of licensed venues on the PRS web website? It would sometimes be easier to search that than entering the details in the reporting tool. Um, we don't make a list of licensed venues available because it would go into tens of thousands. Um, but if you enter something in the reporting tool, that will bring up a list of all the licensed venues with, with that name. So it's, it's not too different from... Um, from looking it up in a, a giant spreadsheet if, if we were able to make something like that available. Okay, thank you. Alexander's just come back with a, a, a follow-up uh, to his question and he asks, is it best to report performances before it happens? Um, you can do if you, if you know about it in advance, um, but it's equally it's fine to report them after as well. Um, it doesn't give you too much advantage. We would just say that we do try to report it sooner rather than later, particularly in the case, case of overseas. Excellent. Okay. All right, Robert, thank you for um, being here and thanks for your question. Robert asks, do you have to be a member of PRS and or a songwriter to report through the new tool? Uh, if you are present when music is performed? You do have to be a member of PRS to use the tool at the moment, um, but it might be that when the tool is developed further in the future that, that this changes. I think one of the things worth, worth mentioning is that certainly from our point of view at the ISM, where our members do compose music um, of whatever type, we would always encourage you to join PRS for Music on the basis that you could be earning royalties and a great deal of work has gone into um, making it easy for you to access royalties um, such as the tools that, that Harriet's been describing. So if you're not a member, think seriously about doing it because um, there's no other way you can access the, this particular right, the performing right, because it's PRS that administers, administers it exclusively, really. So it's your way into getting royalties for your compositions when they're performed, so um, check it out today. All right. I think um, as it's now quarter to two, and we've not had any through for a few minutes, I wonder if it's time that we should um, wrap up. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for joining us today um, for the second of um, Harriet's seminars on this really fascinating topic. Um, investigate it, um, ask questions. PRS are there to help you, an extremely um, strong customer focus. Um, it would be excellent if you could feedback when you use the tools, I'm sure. I'm sure PRS would want to hear how you get on. Just to thank you all very much indeed for joining us today. This will be available on our website um, shortly after we conclude, um, so you can view it again if there's anything that you've missed. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed to Harriet for coming in again today to explain this all so clearly to us. We're very grateful to you for your time and for your clear presentation. Um, we hope we'll see you again soon. I hope so. Thank you very much for having me. And if anybody would like to investigate the PRS um, for Music website is prsformusic.com and you'll find all the information that you need. All right, many thanks to all of you. Thanks again to Harriet. Um, thanks for joining us. We'll see you all soon.